Thank you all for being here. It's an honor <clears throat> to have been asked by Frank to appear at this year's Horasis Global Meeting, especially among my distinguished panelists today. Traditionally, in the world of conferences, the after lunch slot on a Monday <laughs> is a difficult one. Not only is it because it's Monday, and you know, Monday is not everyone's favorite day, but it's after lunch, you've all had a lot of pasta, probably too much pudding, and the temptation would be just to nod off, but you will not be nodding off, believe me, in this wonderful panel and debate which we are about to have, and it's, it's lovely to see the room slowly filling up. I just wanted to tell you, before I hand it over to the panel, a little story. I got on the plane yesterday at, at Heathrow. I got onto one of these A321neos, and I got to my seat, and the man sitting next to me was staring at his laptop, and on the laptop was a picture of, how do I say this, a decaying tooth. It was fairly unpleasant, not what I expected when I came to my seat. Now, I assumed that once I sat down, he would hopefully stop looking at teeth and maybe focus on something else. I was wrong, because two hours later, or for the next two <laughs> hours, I was subjected to a barrage of what can only be described as a horror movie of decaying teeth and gums. So this gentleman clearly was a dentist. Now, being a glass half full gentleman, I thought, I've got to take something positive away from this. And I said to myself, I must find a correlation between decaying teeth and global governance. <laughs> so what I decided was, I decided that global governance, the rules-based system, the multilateral institutions, the oversight bodies to ensure that our common interests are aligned. I decided that if global governance was a mouth, was a set of teeth, this set of teeth, and we'll call this mouth Breton, and let's pretend this mouth is about 70 odd years old. I decided that if this mouth was in need of a visit to the dentist, what sort of remedial treatment would this mouth need, this mouth which, which basically represents global governance? And I asked myself this, would it just be a on-the-surface bit of treatment, a shine and a scrape, like you'd have with your hygienist, your in and out, all on the surface? Would it be something a bit more drastic, maybe a root canal or a filling? <laughs> or would this mouth, the mouth of Breton, as I'm calling it, the 74, five-year-old mouth of Bresson, would this mouth need something a lot more serious? Tear out all the teeth and put in a new set of dentures. I think we all know what I'm getting at here. <laughs> so the moral of the story is inspiration comes from the most unlikely of places. After two hours of being barraged by unhygienic gums, I came out of it feeling good and I knew I had an introduction to the panel today. So these are some of the questions <laughs> I'm going to be asking my illustrious panelists. Essentially, what sort of remedial treatment does global governance need? Now, the format of this wonderful panel, now you've had my introductory remarks, each of the gentlemen to my right will give their own introductory remarks for between five and seven minutes. <coughs> that will last for roughly half an hour. Then we'll have a fiery debate for about 20, 25 minutes. And at the end, I'd like to put it to the floor. I'd like you to ask the panelists some questions as well. So without further ado, I'd like to ask the gentleman to my right, the Minister of Economy here in Portugal, Pedro Cesar Vieira, to start with his introductory remarks. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Mark, and welcome uh, to Portugal to you all. It's a pleasure to be here, and I, can, uh, I greet my fellow participants in this panel. Mark, your remark is very interesting because you've commented on rotten teeth, 
and how best to make it them better. But the one thing you didn't question was the need to have teeth. And my point precisely is, we may question the state of global governance, we may question the state of uh, globalization, but we shouldn't question the need to have cooperation and international uh, proximity between every country in the world for the benefit of, humanity, of mankind. So that's my starting point. I would say that that model which was developed after the Second World War and which was accelerated in the last 20 to 30 years of a global set of rules led by the United States and the Western countries is probably coming to uh, some sort of uh, moment for uh, questioning about its basic foundations. And I think that all this process has worked for everyone's benefit. Um, development around the world, uh, job creation has increased dramatically, massive numbers of members of mankind have been taken out of poverty, and that's all very positive, but there's a backlash to that, and we've seen that in the forms of, most obviously, inequality which has increased in Western countries, and also uh, the impact of migrations. Globalization also facilitates the circulation of people, and because you have uh, the, the, such uh, differences in affluence in societies, you have crisis, you have uh, environmental crisis, you have uh, a number of situations which force people to move, and these two sets of issues, inequality and migrations, create a lot of anxiety particularly in the most developed Western countries. That anxiety is translated into political populism and uh, it is uh, being uh, made a critic of the very fact of globalization. It's like if someone said, my teeth are rotten, I don't want teeth anymore. And that's no, no answer for the problems we are facing. The answer must not be retrenchment, international borders, must not be the preference of uh, our fellow uh, citizens of the same country or the same uh, sort of uh, religion, religious affinities to be closing to themselves. It is how to make sure that in this new moment of mankind where new powers have emerged, where new issues and problems are being created, how should we deal with that? It's not nationalism because that is bad, that puts, it's bad for business and economic growth and I won't even consider that uh, to need to be elaborated, but it's bad also for the values which we as Western democracy values. We value the, the liberty and the, the individual rights uh, and the possibility to live in an open society. So closing the borders, closing the values which are the basis of our globalization should not be the answer. But most of that, it is impossible to close the thing again. You cannot avoid migrations to happen. You cannot avoid people to seek uh, to better their uh, life position. And so that is uh, an issue that we should also consider. So if nationalism, it's a bad idea, and it's actually not possible to, you, we cannot just erect walls and leave everyone outside, because it won't happen, then what should we do? And I think that we should start by acknowledging that the problems that mankind these days face are global problems which can only have global solutions. I'll give you some examples. Migrations. You cannot keep everyone at bay. You will be uh, facing so many difficulties that uh, it would be impossible. You should, but, uh, quite the opposite, invest in developing those countries, particularly those countries in Africa and the Middle East, to try to bring in jobs, prosperity, and peace to those countries which originate migrations. This has to be a global and coordinated effort. Climate change, it is not a, a, we are all faced with the consequences of climate change, whether by human causation or any other factor, 
to fight the consequences of climate change, we need to cooperate globally. Market power for the new, from the new emerging companies in technology, which condition our access to our privacy, which conditions the ability of new companies we can innovate appearing in the market. To fight this market power, you need powers which are significant. And uh, the examples that the European Union is setting in, uh, in establishing uh, standards for privacy, standards for access to data, standards for protection of uh, intellectual rights, these are examples of a power to, 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 that needs to be exercised. Taxation. The issues about raising money to meet social standards is based on national borders and a criteria which were defined many, many years ago where, where you originated your profit where, where was one the, when the, where the profit needed to be taxed. The new digital world means that this is no longer possible, but the only way to address this is to cooperate globally and establish standards which distributes a taxation fairly amongst countries and make that every company which benefits from, from the global economy makes a fair contribution to the world. So these are sorts of, of issues which being global require global answers. And uh, my finding, final comments would be that you need to cooperate to ensure that all that benefit and participate in the global economy and the global uh, social market uh, are uh, required to play by the rules. And we, are, we have partners in this, and certainly the US and Europe should not be seen as enemies in this respect. Secondly, Europe needs to be stronger. Further impetus to integration needs to be there because every European country is a midget in the global economy, and only by having uh, further integration can we uh, survive and thrive in this world. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, if we can have the second introductory remarks from Yves Le Term, who, of course, was the former, is the former Prime Minister of Belgium and currently the Secretary General of International EDEA. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to uh, Mr. Richter and all the organizers behind the scenes for having this debate. I would like to start, Mark, by maybe coming to how I see the essence of foreign policy. Um, I think that still today, foreign policy is to defend in a peaceful way the national interests. It's also to be re-elected, by the way, and sometimes this uh, goes in the same direction, but sometimes also is conflicting. I think the enormous added value of what happened after the Second World War was that based on a kind of strike of the genius, in opposition to what happened after the First World War, where it was more about punishment and revenge, after the Second World War, all political will was put together to have this, not only the sum of national interests at the international level based on bilateral and on, on ad hoc negotiations, but to have this multilateral system that brings more, more added value than just the sum of national interests. The fact that foreign policy is still about defending national interests and that increasingly the legitimacy of world leaders, leaders of nations, is questioned and under pressure and forces them to put these national interests first, has brought <coughs> the multilateral system to a crisis, together with, in parallel, a development, which is per definition not always bad, of going from a bipolar to a monopolar to a more zero-polar chaotic world, so this has changed the whole nature of multilateral cooperation and even brought it very close to a crisis or to difficulties as of today to deliver, to be legitimate and to deliver results. Meanwhile, 
I think we all agree, and the minister has rightly pointed at some of these specific domains, I think we all agree that increasingly the main challenges we are facing as, uh, as, uh, as mankind can only be tackled via a supranational, international approach. The minister pointed at the climate uh, problem. I would say it's one of the top three main issues for the coming decade. I would say the number one is the shift from interstate conflict to intrastate conflict. And the architecture of the multilateral system after the First World War, starting from the nation states participating in that effort, is still designed more predominantly to address issues, security issues and others, of conflicts between states. And today, for instance, the most important origin of insecurity is more interstates and, and conflicts that go through the uh, nation state as a concept. By the way, migration is to a certain extent also an illustration of that more intrastate instead of interstate conflict or tensions. The second is, I think, rightly mentioned, it's the, um, it's the climate issue, which per definition, I won't elaborate on that, but per definition it's a, it's a problem that should be uh, faced uh, globally because the issues of CO2 emissions and so on and the uh, warming of the climate doesn't stop at the borders. The third one, the third domain, where I think it's, it's very obvious that the traditional 19th, 20th century national policy approaches don't work anymore, it's the whole technological development, where national politics not only have troubles to catch up with the pace of development in the technological field, but kind of increasingly are just voiceless. I was a couple of days ago at the meeting in Abidjan and Ivory Coast, and I witnessed people representing Facebook shift now to a position where they ask, they beg, so to say, to have international global regulation for their business, which is a difference. And I was, which is different to their positions until a couple of months ago. But this technological development in the field of communications, for instance, asks even starting from the companies now for global regulation, it's very clear that this cannot be addressed by the national uh, level. <coughs> so this is really a disruption in the kind of problems we are facing. And it is very clear that the multilateral system as it was designed uh, after the First World War is not <coughs> ready to address these challenges. And it should not come as a surprise. It is very normal that solutions engineered almost uh, 80 years ago and that have been very successful, very successful in keeping in very important parts of the globe safe, in having increasing cooperation, better delivery in terms of economic development and so on. It is normal that these system these systems now are not in a good position to address these uh, future, these current, present uh, challenges. Coming to uh, tracks, uh, or, or let's say to directions of solutions, I would uh, propose at least four or five, and some will be a duplication to a certain extent with what the minister has said, the minister of the economy. I would say number one is to uh, be conscious more than ever today that what was engineered after the Second World War, and it has been said by the minister, was engineered by Western uh, people, by people representing Western victorious nations. And so we have to catch up in terms of inclusiveness, at least, of what we have designed. There is a fading away of the traditional nation state, but there's also the problem that, for instance, Security Council, it has been said before, but also other bodies in the monetary field, the financial field, for instance, are not, don't have the legitimacy anymore to say that they represent the majority of the world's population or even the majority of the world's interests. So we have to work at increasing the inclusiveness of multilateral organizations if we want to make them perennial, if we want to make them sustainable. The second one is I think that we should, uh, from a global perspective, pay more attention to some positive developments at what I would call the regional level. And it's not only talking then about the European uh, Union. Also, in other parts of the globe, you see existing institutions sometimes having more successful outcome of their efforts, 
parts in Africa, parts in, in Asia, you have also new institutions that are launched and that kind of translate a willingness to cooperate, be it not on a global level, but be it uh, at, at the regional level. So invest more in capitalizing on these successful attempts at the regional level. The number three is I would very much advocate, instead of having a, uh, let's say, a lot of um, ambitions in terms of a global redesign of global uh, multilateral uh, institutions, is to adopt what we call in Europe the Schumann Doctrine, which means to go step by step and to see what has been successfully done in some domains and to try to copy or to take the good lessons, to draw the good lessons from successful uh, efforts and exercises and to try to translate them on uh, other domains. For instance, the example has been given or you, you have said or the minister has said in the field of taxation. I was the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD at the moment that we managed to strike a deal amongst the 34 main economies in the world to have the so-called measures against base erosion and profit shifting, the so-called BEPS project. This was under the pressure of the need, not because these countries, Japan, the US, European Union and so on, liked very much to make progress. It was just because of the fact that the financing basis of the welfare state was under unsustainable pressure and that the system as such was at the brink of being unsustainable from a financing point of view and that there was a need to guarantee the income to be uh, able to finance also in the future social security system. And pressure was made by civil society organizations, by voters. I think the same is more or less now happening in the field of climate change, where including the public opinion, not only in developed economies, is putting pressure on political leadership to not only sign treaties, but also to deliver in concrete measures. And so these are very concrete steps, and I think to capitalize on these <clears throat> concrete steps is very important. Number four, it is also to have a, and I conclude with that, to have a realistic language, to have a realistic narrative, but also to testify about some successes. Um, we had the Millennium, Millennium Development Goals. It's fair to say that to a certain extent, to a very important extent, we have been successful in achieving those goals. The SDGs are there now. Uh, there will be, I think, next summer, a uh, kind of voluntary assessment of progress by some of the, the, the nations within the UN uh, system. I think progress has been made. Less people are now dying from hunger, uh, there's less starvation, there's improvement in education, there's improvement in uh, economic growth. I think it's important to tell the public opinion, to tell the people in the world that in, through collective efforts and through a step-by-step -step approach that we can be successful. And so this is the fourth tool I would use to try to reinvigorate the multilateral system. Just to conclude, to say that I stress these four uh, elements, uh, not to be different to the minister, I would like to end by saying that, of course, some of the proposals that you made, I also can fully uh, support. Thank you very much. Now, Danilo Turk, of course, former president of Slovenia and uh, current chairman of the UN Global High Panel on Water and peace. Please take it away. Well, thank you, and I'm pleased to be back to Cascais for this interesting debates. And obviously, today we received a very demanding task to talk about global governance in a changing world. And you, Mr. Moderator, suggested to us to use a dental medical uh, metaphor to start with. Now, I would like to say that when I entered politics in Slovenia, I was advised to avoid medical metaphors. They were, <laughs> they were suggest, it was suggested to me that they actually bring a feeling of pain and something wrong, and in politics one should avoid that. But I was told that, uh, that the meteorological metaphors are all right, that you know, politicians who use meteorological metaphors can do well. Now, in this spirit, I would suggest that instead of the dental uh, metaphor we could use if we want to describe the state of global governance today, uh, you know, the April weather in place like Kashkai, you know, things are changing. There is a, clearly a change from one world to another world, and there is a degree of unpredictability in all this. 
Therefore, I think it is useful to ask ourselves about the basics of governance. Now, every governance, national, local, international, depends on two factors. First, power. Without power, there is no governance. And second, legitimacy. Without legitimacy, there is no sustainability of governance. And that applies for states, that applies to international system. And right now, we see changes in both of these areas. The power structure in the world is changing, and is changing quite dramatically which is unpredictable, and hopefully, with some wisdom and luck, we can avoid major disasters. And the sense of legitimacy is changing. Uh, I don't need to go too far into details to explain this. Everybody can see that the era of <clears throat> unipolar world is over, that a new type of multipolarity is slowly emerging. And in that context, one can see the rise of Global South, which I think is a very important new element which is underestimated nowadays. It's not only about uh, United States, China, Russia, Europe, Japan, it's also about the Global South, which is becoming a more and more important part of the global power landscape. On the legitimacy side, we can see that the role of the bearers of legitimacy, such as the United Nations, is being eroded. The uh, United Nations has now been sidelined to a very serious extent and uh, having spent quite a bit of time uh, in the last four decades following the work of the United Nations and working at the United Nations, I can say it hasn't been so bad for the last 40 years. I mean, it's, it's really now marginalization and also lack of authority. Uh, which comes with this disappearing or uh, weakening sense of legitimacy of the United Nations. Uh, you just look at what's happening in Libya <coughs> and how the military conflict is taking over at variance with everything that the UN has been standing for. So this is the situation in which we are. Uh, changing world, changing power structure, changing sense of legitimacy. The important thing here, I believe, is that we have to understand that the period of binary system which was prevailing during the Cold War is irreversibly over, and that we have to adjust to something new. And that new, I think, can be described with the word competition. Competition is going to be the dominant, uh, the dominant feature of this emerging multipolar world, which will hopefully gradually develop a new sense of legitimacy and new strength of international law. Competition is not necessarily bad. When people talk about competition, they very often think about risks primarily, and not so much about the opportunities. But competition brings both risks and opportunities, and I think it would be very important to figure out what the opportunities are. And sometimes these opportunities emerge unexpectedly. Now, Prime Minister Leterm spoke about the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which surprised us all by the fact that the actual performance, actual effects uh, in 2013, close to the end of the Millennium Development Goals period, uh, were better than expected. In 2000, people did not expect that the world would go that far with the reduction of poverty. We have realized that, obviously, a large part of that improvement uh, rested on the success of China and Asia more, general, more generally. And here, of course, we have something very interesting. Some of us who still remember writings of somebody like Gunnar Myrdal half a century ago about the Asian drama, uh, which looked like a pretty hopeless situation of Asia, have to revise our thinking a great deal and see Asia as the pivot of change for the future. <clears throat> that will, of course, bring competition, but it will give opportunities also. And I think one has to look into that uh, with, uh, with care and figure out where the opportunities are and make use of them. Finally, to take some courage from the past experience, I think it is important to think about the sustainable development goals. Now, sustainable development goals are sometimes perceived as purely a bureaucratic product of the United Nations. Sometimes they are perceived as a result of a single negotiation back in 2014 and 2015. But in fact, one has to see a longer history in that. Uh, the UN system or the global system in, as a whole 
has gone through very different stages of conceptualizing development. And that those were rather simple things from trickle-down theory, which prevailed in 1960s and 70s, new international economic order, a sense, uh, a quest for redistribution of wealth, which, which failed, uh, to the ending of Cold War, and the whole set of conferences that redefined development in the 1990s. They were then subsequently summarized in the Millennium Development Goals, and then further developed into a comprehensive system in the sustainable development goals. So we can take some courage from the fact that the evolution over several decades has produced a framework which can help. Now, we have to be careful, of course. Sandy Vaslekar yesterday spoke about two directions globalization, and one direction leading towards progress, the other direction leading towards uh, risks and disasters. And clearly, there is a danger here. Um, the uh, often quoted uh, problems of inequality in distribution of wealth are very real. There are predictions that if the world is not going to change, we can end up with having a system of gated communities for the rich and uh, struggle for survival for everybody else. And that's clearly a scenario that the world should avoid. So therefore, I think it would be useful to, to look into competition as an opportunity and see what the development in the past decade, decades produced as promise for the future. Let us work on that basis. And if obviously, if a large part of that promise is development in China, let us focus on that and see how working with China through such instruments as Belt and Road Initiative and others can help further development. <coughs> in such a cooperative scheme and you know, within the framework of sustainable development goal, I think goals, I think the world has a chance. We shouldn't be overly pessimistic. We shouldn't look into the fate of the world as a problem of decaying teeth, which of course can be a little bit corrected at the age of 70 and more, but not really brought to the full strength anymore. I think the world can look for improvement of climatic conditions and uh, to, a, to a summer which will be obviously uh, good for, up for many, if not for everybody, and will bring good fruits in autumn. That is my thought on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now our last uh, panelist, the former Prime Minister of Romania, the former EU Agriculture Commissioner, Dacian Cioloș. Thank you. So, well, when we talk about global governance, we think, first of all, how to manage the globalization. Our first meeting with uh, this global governance was uh, globalization, and uh, the core issue of globalization was around uh, economic uh, globalization. So, uh, we need, uh, in order to, to talk about uh, global governance, we need uh, now, a new approach, a new understanding about how supranational should uh, concretize it in day-to-day, uh, -day, uh, in our day-to-day -day life, in the day-to-day -day life of our citizens. And we need to transform supranational uh, decision or the debate in national or local day-to-day uh, -day economic and social measures, but also when we take decision at local level, we have to bear in mind and to be aware by the fact that our local decision cannot be isolated and they have an effect and an impact on some uh, fields uh, globally, and they have a global uh, impact. So, myself, before to be a politician or a prime minister, I am an agronomic engineer and I like to keep my feet on the, on the ground and to take into account the, the reality uh, on the spot. And uh, keeping my feet on the ground, I will try to develop uh, very shortly two ideas. First of all, we need to bring global governance in a more transparent way close to what citizens expect. And to understand when we talk about globalization, how this is perceived by the people and uh, how it is translated by the people in their life, uh, in the daily life. And secondly, uh, in order to do that, we need to rethink some of the global governance aspect 
that were taken for granted these last uh, years, almost like a dogma, and to understand and to see the fact that uh, sometimes better solutions are not always uh, at a global level. So uh, what citizens expect? When I talk about uh, supranational uh, governance, first of all, I, uh, I'm, I think to European Union, I had experienced this directly as Romania's former European uh, commissioner. You know, European Union, it's first of all a project of peace, of prosperity, a space of freedom, of uh, human rights, and we try to avoid building European Union uh, countries uh, that used to fight uh, each other. Uh, we are still uh, a group of 28 uh, member states that freely decide uh, to cooperate, to jointly manage a number of uh, policies, to have common standards, so to think how to share uh, together some decision. But uh, strangely, today Europe and European Union seems to be more popular outside than uh, inside. We see millions of people wanted to migrate uh, through European Union, but on the uh, meantime, inside, uh, we see uh, some of uh, the people blaming European Union for everything that goes wrong, or even uh, wanted to leave it. So how did we arrive at that? Uh, what we need to be done in order to uh, rethink and reshuffle this kind of supranational uh, kind of institutions. And uh, back, uh, back in Romania and being now in, in campaign and campaigning about uh, European Union for European elections, I see, uh, uh, I feel uh, the fact that a, lot, a large part of citizens are uh, disconnected and they are feeling disconnected to, uh, from the European Union. And uh, some of them, they do not trust European Union because this level, it's, even if it's a continental one, seems to be sometimes too far for the uh, expectation of people, of the uh, citizens. Uh, when we look at some Eurobarometers, just to give you some uh, figures, we see uh, European citizens, they are worried about their security, first of all. We're discussing more and more about how to fight together uh, fighting terrorism and radicalization and the migration, and all these issues are on the top of the uh, preoccupation of uh, European citizens. We see also European uh, citizens uh, talking about uh, the effect of climate change and the uh, risk uh, are threatening for the European uh, Union. And these uh, risks uh, have also an impact on the uh, manner that the people uh, perceive the capacity or capacity to produce food uh, because of the spread of pests, uh, resistance of treatment, instability of the world uh, trade system, uh, and, uh, and so on. Citizens are also worried about uh, the effect of globalization. They feel exposed in a fierce international competition on low cost and low wage, and they are uh, anxious about uh, losing their jobs because of the decision taken somewhere in an office or another continent thousands of kilometers away. Uh, they are confronted also with the risk of disruptive technologies. Uh, not only ICT, but also artificial intelligence, uh, Internet of Things and automotive uh, driving. So these are some of the things that the, the people are worried and uh, the question is how we are uh, and in which manner we are uh, uh, aware and we are in measure to, to answer to, to that. Because when the citizens do not feel safe, they are more prone to listening of populism and uh, political uh, extremism. So what we can do in this uh, uh, situation? First of all, it is clear for me that one of the causes of the anti-globalization trend is the fact that the global government system have ignored local governance and local communities and local identities. The effects are visible on the market also. Just to give uh, some example, uh, we see in the agri-food sector, consumers are more and more focused uh, not only on the price and standardization, but more focused on local products, on traditional quality food, uh, cultural specificities. 
And for markets, this means more diversity, better quality, and better informed consumers. More than uh, mere consumers, they are becoming also uh, doing this uh, more active citizens, more interesting on the impact of agriculture on the local uh, environment, on the biodiversity, and, and uh, so on. So this is a manner this last year to see where the people are more and more oriented also to solve some global problem uh, with local uh, solution, with uh, local food system. But also the sharing economy, uh, it's more and more pre present. Citizens uh, have a trend to rely more and more uh, on each other and on their communities and uh, less on traditional institutions. Uh, some prefer uh, Airbnb, for example, for sleeping, sleeping in a stranger's house rather than sleeping in a hotel. Or uh, we see uh, small enterprises and startups or new projects prefer crowdfunding uh, rather than uh, take money from the banks. Taxi and rental car uh, companies have become more and more old-fashioned, losing the competition with ride-sharing and car-sharing. So we see also the spirit of communitarization and that the people want to be connected locally in order to solve some global problems and to find local solutions and uh, common uh, solutions in order to uh, give answers to some uh, uh, global uh, challenges. And if we do not listen, if we do not understand these new trends, we will lose our citizens to the populists and the extremists that are challenging the fundamentals of our uh, societies and uh, democracies. <coughs> it's clearly that poverty, migration, climate change, food security, all these areas, uh, we need to, uh, to treat this at uh, global uh, governance and, uh, and drive but maybe sometimes the solutions can be found uh, locally. So, in conclusion, this is, uh, this is a challenge uh, for us uh, today. How to be present on the ground in the local debate and the local decisions in order to find solutions for, for some uh, global uh, challenges. Uh, we, need, we live uh, in an internet era and uh, speaking, uh, we need to speak the language of the local uh, challenges and less uh, to use uh, a too uh, generalizing uh, wording because uh, when the people uh, do not have a job, they do not have a job and uh, uh, they do not care about uh, discussing about better institutional decision making or more goodwill about uh, G20, we, they need a concrete solution and sometimes concrete solution means to be adapted uh, uh, locally. Uh, we need also to mind the challenges and to assume it, uh, to give just an example about uh, climate change, even if uh, uh, Europe is polluting less and less and uh, all you member states uh, and the local community should come uh, to this uh, trend. Uh, even if the rest of the world take less measures, we need to understand that uh, the solution not be to uh, to copy-paste uh, the same model and to say if they, the others, they don't take uh, measures, so why, why to do this? And uh, we need to be more concrete and realistic in our decision, and it's better uh, forward, but uh, concrete measures on migration, that endless formal com commitments, which change very little in, uh, in the ground. Uh, we need... Uh, to commit on what we really can do, uh, what is feasible, rather than uh, what we should do and we cannot uh, deliver. And I think on this way, uh, we can do a credible uh, global governance, taking into account local realities and especially taking into account uh, local solutions to uh, global issues. Thank you. Thank you. One of the more notable periods for global cooperation was during the global financial crisis in 2008, where the G20 came to the fore, particularly under the UK Prime Minister at that time, Gordon Brown. Minister, is it only in wartime, in times of a crisis, where there might be a more pressing need or urgency to shake up the system? 
Well, it is true that times of crisis, times of urgency, uh, really focus everyone's attention on the issues at hand and force the uh, uh, players to act. But it is true that having structures in place, having uh, strategies in place, having the framework and the trust between global leaders fosters the action, the coordinated action in a situation of crisis. So one of the issues is, uh, is the world more uh, able to cooperate if the call for action is there or not? Is there, are there the conditions of trust in place or not? And that's where the, uh, the existence of uh, forums, uh, which we got used to in the last few decades, is important. And I think it is important to articulate how we can uh, work together in order to have the basis to tackle these global problems, and uh, some of which were mentioned in, the, in this context. Because the simple existence of those, uh, of those structures uh, enable people to act when needed. I'm not, I'm not convinced that uh, we would be facing a crisis such as the global financial crisis in the next few years. But the thing is that we are facing a number of problems which are lagging, which are insinuating, which are uh, impeding further progress in a number of issues which we have identified in this conversation, mm. which require action, even in the absence of an obvious crisis. And that's where the need to work together and to build trust among the, the, the great powers is more important. Prime Minister Leterme, there might be a view held that the world isn't ready for the next crisis if you compare the US stance then, China, the ability of monetary policy to come to the aid of global economies, coming to the minister's comments there. Is the world ready to cooperate? Yes, maybe we aren't going to have a crisis or a big global war or whatever in the next few years, but if something was to emerge, be it economically, politically, socially, are the institutions in place ready to cooperate? Are we ready to cooperate or not? Well, I would say that uh, as far as I witness what happened over the last decades and, and also based on personal experience, I think that once you're confronted with a crisis, indeed the need makes some solutions possible and also gives birth to uh, new institutions. The J20 you pointed at mm. is a very recent uh, phenomenon. Also a trial to have this inclusive approach of global policies. The second element of answer is a bit provocative. Uh, I think personally, but that's not personal wisdom, it's based on, on listening to all kinds of uh, very expert people. I think the uh, proof whether we are, uh, or the answer to the question whether we are ready or not to face a new challenge of a financial economic crisis, this challenge could come very quickly because it's, it's, very, it's very obvious that we uh, try to solve, and I was then chairing the European Union on behalf of my country that was severely hit by the banking crisis, I think one of the weaknesses of the global response to the financial crisis was basically that we combated the evil by adding more evil. I mean, there was a uh, financial crisis, banking crisis, that then came to a sovereign debt crisis, and we solved the global issue also of slowing down of economic growth in adding more debt. And so today we should be very well aware of the fact that a very important part of the economic growth is fueled by quantitative easing and by piling up debt. And not only in China, also in the Western economies. Uh, so to summarize, I think that indeed the need creates a political response. And I'm quite an optimistic in terms of that at that moment, people indeed find the creativity, but more than that, the political will to act. And so I would not be too negative. The second element to, to, to your question, the second element of answer is that the problem you're pointing at, I think we could very soon be confronted with the uh, challenge, the risk, or the opportunity to prove that we indeed can address uh, issues like a potential further slowing down of economic growth, uh, problem with the, the, the debt we have been piling up, and the need for global solutions, including monetary and 
solutions that uh, on a global level uh, include agreements on reducing debt. Do, do you agree, President uh, Turk, that possibly this period of turbulence actually might be yeah. coming sooner than we think? Well, I think Prime Minister Leterm said something which is really very important, and that is when crisis comes, then the ability to learn and react increases. And we have seen this in the financial crisis of 2007 and in the subsequent years. However, however, we have to understand two other things. First, today, the political atmosphere is worse than it was in 2007 and 2008. I mean, the uh, relations among the major powers are not um, conducive to quick consensus. So one has to be careful with uh, expectations in case if a major crisis erupts. Uh, the second thing is perhaps a little less uh, disturbing, and that is uh, what we hear from the financial circles like the IMF uh, and what we understand from the way the negotiations between China and the United States are going. We should not expect a, a big crisis anytime soon. There may be a slowdown, there may be problems which obviously will have to be managed, but not something that would require a very dramatic uh, reorganization of international system or international cooperation in, in general. So I think if one understands these two parameters, then I think we can think about the policy approach that needs to be taken. Just one final remark. Assuming that the Sino-American negotiations go reasonably well, the world will still have to figure out how to improve the world trading system through World Trade Organization. The problem is there, and it has to be addressed. The question of protection of intellectual property, the question of state subsidies, the question of settlement of trade disputes, and all this, this is a huge agenda, a difficult one. So we should not think that if the crisis is avoided, the problems will not require solutions. No, there are very, very real problems there, and there are no solutions yet inside. Now, of course, everybody is waiting now to see what happens between the United States and China. But assuming that then that this process goes reasonably well, then the other question will arise. How to reshape the world trading system? And then, obviously, furthermore, financial system as well. And these, obviously, are very big tasks. Prime Minister Cholos, just on the matter of trade, what, is, there, is there a view to be held that maybe regional trade agreements and that there, are, there's a, there is some need and there is some desire for them, whether it's EU-Japan, in the Pacific region, or bilateral agreements? I mean, do, are they not sufficient? Or do we have to have multilateral trade agreements? Because some of these regional agreements with multiple parties, 10, 11, 12, 13, seemingly some could say that's a success. We tried, in fact, a, a global agreement with Doha Round in a certain way. And we negotiated several years. And after several years, the conclusion was that we are not able to find the global solutions also because there are transformation, very accelerated transformation in the world. Some countries like uh, India, Brazil, uh, uh, which were uh, um, developing countries some years ago, became now emerging countries, and uh, they are facing uh, specific problems inside to be, uh, to be managed also uh, in uh, global negotiations, because Brazil and India they have to manage their ambitions to be exporters in agri-food sector, for example, but also in industry. But in the meantime, they need to protect some of their sectors uh, so uh, they, they cannot conclude in a, in a global agreement. So we see that uh, finally the, the solution is to, uh, uh, to go to regional uh, negotiations and to, to find uh, Common, uh, common ground on the interest and the first stage, and then to see uh, step by step on which sector we can have a global understanding 
and in which other uh, sectors we need to treat this uh, specifically. Mm. And this is the case even for European Union, because the European Union enlarged it to 28 or in the future 27 member states. The diversity of situation to be managed is very diverse, is very, is very big. When you see the interest between Western countries and Eastern countries, uh, you see how complex and how difficult it is for the European Commission to negotiate uh, uh, some agreements uh, on behalf of the European Union. So, Minister, how do we create more space for the likes of China, for other developing economies? How do we create more space within the international governance system without ceding ground on some of the core fundamental principles? <clears throat> Well, I think we, well, what we need to see is that, uh, as I said in concluding my initial remarks, we need to make sure that everyone that participates in an open global economy <coughs> play by the same set of rules which are fair to all. China has entered the international trade system and has benefited from that massively on the basis that it was a, a country, a, an undeveloped country. And a number of rules which still apply to China are based on something which uh, was defined uh, uh, 25 years ago, that China was still a very poor country, undeveloped country. Sure. And in uh, the global logistics chains, in the uh, tariffs, the, the access that it grants to its own market, it benefits from rules which do not apply to more developed countries. Mm -hmm. So I think some of the topics we are seeing in this shifting of the system and the negotiations and the, the rebuilding of the global institutions have to do with the fact that probably the system was extremely effective in allowing the access of developed countries to the uh, uh, develop, developing countries to the developed world and the developed markets. And, uh, and we now need to rebalance that. But we must make that that's uh, my belief. We must make that on the basis still of multilateral uh, rules applied by international organizations rather than trying to redress and fight the thing on a bilateral basis. My point. Yeah, Prime Minister Leterm, Xi Jinping did actually call for his nation to, I quote, lead the reform of the global governance system. Sure. Is that possible? And I think President. It, uh, I think it's, uh, it's not only possible, it's also more or less to what, to a certain extent, will happen. I would not underestimate the, uh, uh, what has been developing in new thinking in China, which is still led by the Communist Party, that is more a party than a communist uh, organization, very pragmatic, uh, very uh, focused on economic development, and maybe even only sustainable if there is sufficient economic development in the future. Um, I think the, 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 the volume China has and the, uh, the assets it has creates an opportunity for that country also to, I would not say to organize itself outside of the Western dominated system, but still I think what happened with this uh, bank, which is a kind of duplication to the World Bank, uh, what happens with the Shanghai Corporation, um, and I could give other examples, is a kind of token that they, they want to reorganize, they want to integrate the world system, but they also want to serve their national interests and serve their interests. And until now, I refer to all kinds of statements, including in Davos a couple of years ago, this is done with a lot of intelligence for the acceptability to the outside world. And even the Belt and Road Initiative is until now well, I would put it in another way. Notwithstanding all our rhetorics on development aid, I would say that to a certain extent currently, and if you put aside all kinds of geopolitical interests of China, the Belt and Road Initiative is the most massive development aid project of the, of the present times. So to summarize the answer to your question, I think Xi Jinping's intention is indeed to integrate, but it will be also at, <coughs> in accordance to a certain view that could be a little bit different to us, and it's not only a narrative, it's not only a talkative approach, it's also proving in facts uh, what, what, what their political will is. Just to conclude, mm. one single sentence, I want to defend the interests of Europe, and I'm a strong believer in the 
um, in the capacity of the European societies con to continue to develop as the best societies to live in. This being said, we should be conscious here in Cascais that we are citizens of a continent with, with good weather and not too much storm has 650, 700 million inhabitant citizens. We are a kind of peninsula at the extreme left side of the Eurasian map. And we are living on top of a ticking demographic bump. So to still have the, uh, let's say, the ambition to be the center of the world, including in terms of the way we see global governance, I'm not sure that this is the best approach to uh, face the challenges of today and tomorrow. Well, you know, about the reform of the international system. Now, these things happen in ways which are sometimes unpredictable, but, but they do happen. Let me give you an example. Uh, in early 1980s, the United States proposed um, that uh, the then existing General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade should include trade in services. And that came as a big innovation at the time. Uh, at that time, people were used to gut the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade as something that deals with the trading goods, tariffs, non-tariff barriers, and these sort of things. So to introduce services was a huge innovation, and it was felt that it's not clear whether that, that thing belongs to trading. And now, a few years later, we have received a new organization, which first of all included such things as trade-related investment measures, trade-related intellectual property matters, and then later the World Trade Organization was created instead or as a successor of the general agreement. So things do happen, and they happen in ways which cannot be planned entirely. And as, when, when it comes to China, there are things happening in different ways. I mean, the one way is establishment of additional regional institutions, which are not substitute for global institutions, but a supplement. Shanghai Cooperation Organization, for example, or the Asian Invest, uh, Infrastructural Investment mm -hmm. Bank. I don't consider these institutions to be a replacement. They are a regional addition. Belt and Road, of course, it represents, in a way, competition to the ruling West, but it represents an opportunity as well. On my way to Kashkais, I was reading uh, in the airplane an interesting document of European Union, uh, which was just published a few weeks ago on relations between EU and China. Uh, and this is going to be a big subject in the coming months. And it's interesting, during the last year, EU and China, uh, not being always on completely same page, have agreed about the need for reform in the World Trade Organization. And the European Union very rightly emphasizes that China can no longer be considered as a developing country, and that there has to be a change in that regard as well. But then the European Union is somewhat, um, how should I say, funnily worried about another innovation, which is 16 plus 1. China plus 16 countries from Central and Eastern Europe, some of them being members of the European Union and others not. Now, I would say this is a good example of competition which is emerging, where EU has very important assets, uh, in particular as regards the um, planning and the existing patterns of communications and infrastructure development, protection of environment, and other you know, rules that have to be applied. And there is no, in my opinion, it doesn't make any sense to object to this sort of innovation, which is ref reformational in essence. It is important to figure out how the rules that have to be preserved apply to this innovation and other innovations that are going to happen. And this is the kind of world which, which we are living, the world which is changing and where I think we have both challenges and above all opportunities. Prime Minister Cholos, given that the US has underpinned the rules-based system for, for many decades, given the Trump administration has this approach, it's a bilateral approach, as we know, it, 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 uh, its view towards multilateral organizations, I don't even need to say. Can, can reform, can progress be made when you have the, the the body that's underpinning the entire system seemingly against it? 
I think the reaction of Trump administration and President Trump is in a certain manner the proof that even United States in the current situation, they didn't believe that the current global international uh, organizational system are able to give answer to, to the challenges. And uh, I think this is more the question for the future, how this current international organizational system are adapted to the current realities, the real and the pragmatic current realities. When we look uh, the objective of China to be more and more present in Africa in a very direct and sometimes uh, aggressive uh, uh, manner, when we see uh, on the other side the, the difficulty of FAO, for example, just to give an example, the difficulties to put on the table the real uh, problems and the real question about uh, land grabbing, about uh, food security, about uh, the efficiency of uh, uh, agri-food policies at national or regional level. This uh, proof that our question that we are facing in the, in the future is how to rethink uh, the international uh, global uh, organizational system in order to integrate some uh, real players. Because we have states, we have regions, we have uh, multinational companies, we have more and more international organization of civil society having a word to say on the, on the climate change, on poverty, uh, migration, and so on. And my impression is that we are in a transitional period and we have to look more than to try to find uh, uh, national uh, solutions, to look to, to the realities and to try to find uh, new solutions at international level, taking into account also some other realities. How much the current political system has the credibility to put on the table uh, answers uh, accepted by, uh, by the societies? Because we see uh, in some part of the world more and more uh, the current political system uh, put it into question with corruption uh, system, with uh, lack of efficiency of uh, of uh, some political parties and, and so on. Thank you. Well, we just have time for a question or two. Lady at the front, I think we're going to be passing a microphone to you. Could you put your microphone to about people that have diff difficulties to hear? Yes. I think that the question was about how each country is coping with an aging population. We weren't hearing you, so there you go. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, I, could, I could only answer globally, not specifically focusing on, yeah. on people with uh, difficulties, disabilities to, to hear or to speak. I think that globally I would say three things. Number one is that it is of utmost importance to reduce debt. If you want to have a financial sustainability of the pension schemes for the future, you now have to reduce debt. I think in most of the Western European countries, in terms of the elderly uh, people, we have in um, terms of uh, infrastructure for elderly people, uh, homes for elderly people where uh, uh, care is taken of these uh, citizens. We already have a very good uh, infrastructure that is, uh, well, when you compare it to other blocks in the world, 
which is quite well developed. I would say that there, for instance, we've been talking about China with the aging of the population in China, the challenges are bigger. <clears throat> Where I think we sometimes uh, fail, but there's a, kind of, uh, there's a kind of attempt to catch up, is to better customize the offer. And in the customization of the offer to the aging population, that means that in every stage of the aging, you have a very well adapted offer where it can start from a bit of support, people staying still in their houses, in their own houses, going through an, an intramural uh, taking care of people. In this kind of, uh, let's say, phasing out of autonomy and increasing uh, dependency of, of uh, outside help that there to adapt this, to customize the, the, uh, the offer in terms of the quality also, and to adapt the offer to the real needs of people that there we still have uh, a lot of work to do to catch up. But to sum up, I think a reduction of debt to be able to have a social security system with a good coverage, that means uh, financial sustainability, and in the real uh, homes and adapted uh, caretaking offer, I think we already have a lot of things in place compared to other continents, but we have to better customize it and to promote the autonomy of people as long as possible living outside of this intramural offer. That would be my first reaction to your question that is a bit far away from the geopolitical challenges. Yes, I think this is, this is a very significant factor. I think we will be facing an aging population, but my, I would submit that this is not a bad thing in itself. I, uh, when I was born in this country, life expectancy was 25 years less than it is now. And the 65-year-old, when I was a child, was a very old man, mm. ailing, uh, which would probably only live for a couple of years more. He would not be able to work, he would have a series of illnesses. And a 65-year-old now is a productive member of, of society, uh, in good health, which has a, a, an ability to continue to contribute in different manners to society. And this is the first thing that we should look into. This is a blessing, and we should treasure that the fact that mankind has been able to evolve from having a life expectancy in Western Europe of 40 years in the beginning of the 20th century, and we are now probably talking about a life expectancy of late 80s to 90s in the same continent. We should, make sh we should also remember that there are lots of young people in the world, and we will need those young people in our aging societies. The US is a relatively young population because it benefits from the contribution of millions of immigrants which continue to arrive and have children that in that country. And the third thing is uh, not only making sure that we can provide uh, income to an aging population, that we can provide and adapt and customize care to people in relation to their own preferences rather than having a sort of uh, mass uh, response. We should also make sure that we build a society where the contribution of seniors is appreciated rather than being seen as a weight on the rest of society. I have to apologize. I'm being forced to wrap it up. I'd go on forever, but uh, sorry, time. Of course, no, time is against us. So I apologize for overrunning, but it was an absolutely fascinating panel. Please applaud our panelists. Yeah,